Section 22 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Reynolds, Albany, New York. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 22. But what about Branton Hills municipal affairs right now? In two months, it was to ballot on who should sit in past Councilman Anter's chair. And a campaign was on which was actually sizzling. And in what a contrast to our city's start! For it has grown rapidly, and in comparison to that day upon which a thousand ballots was a big outpouring of popular clamor, now many politicians had city hall aspirations. And who do you think was running for council now? William Gadsby, popularly known as Bill. Bill, Branton Hills' famous dandy. Bill, that consummation of all Branton Hills girls' most romantic wish. Bill, that outdoor part of Branton Hills' most aristocratic tailor shop. Naturally, opposing groups fought for that vacancy, part of our population clamoring loudly for Bill but with many just as strongly against him. So it was. Put Bill Gadsby in. Bill has all our mayor's good points. Bill will work for all that is upright and good. And also, what? Bill Gadsby? Is this town plumb crazy? Say, if you put that fop in City Hall, you'll find all its railings flapping with pink satin ribbons, a janitor at its main door squirting vanilla on all who go in, and its front lawn will turn into a pansy farm. Put a man in City Hall, not a sissy who thinks out upsy downsy insy outsy camping suits for girls. But though this didn't annoy Bill, it did stir up Nancy, with, Oh, that's just an abomination, such talk about so grand a young chap. But I just saw a billboard with a sign saying Bill Gadsby for counsel. So probably I shouldn't worry, for Bill is as good as in. Baby, said Gadsby kindly, that's only a billboard, and billboards don't put a man in City Hall. It's ballots, darling, thousands of ballots that fill council chairs. But, Daddy, I'm going to root for Bill. I'll stand up on a stump, or in a tip cart, or... Whoa, wait a bit. And Gadsby sat down by his baby girl, saying, You can't go on a stumping campaign without knowing a lot about municipal affairs, which you don't. Any antagonist who knows about such things would out-talk you without half-trying. No, darling, this political stuff is too big for you. You just look out for things in that small bungalow of yours and allow Branton Hills to fight to put Bill in. You know my old slogan, man at a city's front, woman at a cabin door. And Nancy, fondly stroking his hand, said, Man at a city's front? What a grand post for a man! A city, a big, rushing, dashing, slamming, banging, boiling mass of humanity. A city, with its bright, happy, sunny parks, and its sad, dark slums. Its rich mansions and its shantytown shacks. Its shops, inns, shows, courts, airports, railway stations, hospitals, schools, church groups, social clubs, and, and, oh, what a magic visualization of human thought it is. But it is as a small child. It looks for a strong arm to support its first toddlings, for adult minds to pilot it around many pitfalls, and onward, onward, to a shining goal. And Nancy's crown of rich brown hair sank lovingly in Gadsby's lap. During this outburst, Gadsby had sat dumb, but finally saying proudly, So ho! My baby girl has grown up. Dolls and sand-digging tools don't call, as of old, and small, dirty paws and a tiny, smudgy chin transform, almost in a twinkling, into charming hands and a chin of maturity. My, my, it was but a month or two ago that you, in Pigtails and Gingham... No, Daddy, it was a mighty long month or two ago, and it's not Pigtails and Gingham now, but a husband and a baby. All right, kid, but as you grow old, you'll find that in glancing backwards, months look mighty short and small tots grow up almost in a night. A month from now looks awfully far off, but last month? Pfft, that was only last night. Thus did Nancy and his honor talk, until a vigorous honking at his curb told of Frank looking for a cook, for it was six o'clock. 
End of section 22. Section 23 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 23 any man with so kindly a disposition toward youth as has brought our mare forward in branton hill's history may without warning run across an occasion which holds an opportunity for adding a bit of joy in living so as gadsby stood on a chilly fall day in front of that big glass building which was built for a city florist admiring a charming display of blossoming plants a small girl still in grammar school said shyly halloa halloa you school out on saturdays school is always out that's so it is saturday isn't it going in in my no i can't go into that fairyland no why not pray ah uh, i dunno but nobody has took kids in took took say young lady you must study your grammar book branton hills schools don't uh huh i know but a kid just can't by golly a kid can grab my hand now many a fairy book has told in glowing words of childhood's joys and thrills at amazing sights but no fairy book could show in cold print what gadsby ran up against as that big door shut and a child stood stock still and dumb two small arms hung limply down against a poor oh so poor skirt and two big staring brown orbs took in that vision of floral glory which is found in just that kind of a big glass building on a cold raw autumn day gadsby said not a word slowly strolling down a path amidst thousands of gladioli around a turn and up a path along which stood pots and pots of fuchsias salvias and cannas and to a cross path down which was a big flat pansy patch tubs of blossoming lilacs and stiff straight carnations not a word from gadsby for his mind was on that small bunch of rapturous joy just in front of him but finally just to pry a bit into that baby mind his honor said looks kind of good don't it a tiny form shrunk down about an inch and an also tiny bosom rising and falling in a thraldom of bliss finally put forth a long long oh it was so long that gadsby was in a quandary as to how such small lungs could hold it now in watching this tot thrilling at its first visit to such a world of floral glory gadsby got what boys call a hunch and said you don't find blossoms in your yard this month do you if you know childhood you know that thrills don't last long without a call for information and gadsby got such a call with no sir is this god's parlor now gadsby wouldn't for anything spoil a childish thought so said kindly it's part of it god's parlor is awfully big you know my parlor is awfully small and not any bloss oh wouldn't god gadsby's hunch was now working full tilt and so as this loving family man having had four kids of his own and this tot from a poor family with its awfully small parlor had trod this big glass building's paths again and again round and round an almost monstrous sigh from an almost bursting tiny bosom said i'll think of god's parlor always and always and always and gadsby on glancing upwards saw a distinct drooping and curving of many stalks which is a plant's way of bowing to a child and at branton hills following council night a motion was but i said gadsby had a hunch so not only this schoolgirl's awfully small parlor but many such throughout branton hills poor districts soon found a big girl from gadsby's original organization of youth at its front door with plants from that big glass building 
in which our city florist works in god's parlor p s go with a child to your city florist's big glass building it's a duty end of section twenty three section twenty four of gadsby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen gadsby by ernest vincent wright chapter twenty four i am now going back to my saying that a city has all kinds of goings-on both sad and gay so as his honor sat on his porch on a warm spring day a paragraph in branton hills post brought forth such a vigorous huh that lady gadsby was curious asking what is it so gadsby said what do you think of this it says in a wild swaying dash down broadway last night at midnight past councilman antor's car hit a hydrant killing him and madame antor instantly highway patrolman harry grant who was chasing that car in from our suburbs says both horribly drunk antor grazing four cars madame shouting and singing wildly with grant arriving too tardily to ward off that final crash now lady gadsby was first of all a woman and so got up quickly saying oh i must go down to poor young mary right off and gadsby sat tapping his foot saying so antor's pantry probably still holds that stuff too bad but oh that darling mary just got into high school not long ago lucy told us of girls snubbing that kid but i trust that from this horror our branton hills girls will turn from snubbing to pity this account says that madame antor also was drunk a woman drunk and riding with a rum sot man at a car's controls woman from history's dawn man's soft fawn-loving pale woman for whom wars of blood and agony cut man down as you would mow a lawn woman to whom infancy and childhood look for all that is upright and good it's too bad too bad as in all such affairs you will always find two factions talking talking about what just now about norman antor what would this wiping out of his folks do to him norman was now living with mary and two aunts who coming from out of town would try to plan for our two orphans try to plan for norman norman brought up in a pool of liquor norman tall dark and manly and with a most ingratiating disposition if not drunk but nobody could say a group would claim that this fatality will bring him out of it but his antagonists thought that that guy will always drink a day or two from that crash nancy coming into gadsby's parlor found lucy talking with lady gadsby lucy asking nancy who is with young mary antor now that pair of aunts wouldn't stay with all that liquor around i just found out said nancy mary is living with old lady flanagan and lucy though sad had to laugh just a bit saying ha ha old lady flanagan what a circus i had trying to pry a zoo donation from that poor soul's skimpy funds but nancy mary is in mighty good hands that loving old irish lady is a trump end of section twenty four section twenty four of gadsby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen gadsby by ernest vincent wright chapter twenty five along in april gadsby sat finishing his morning toast as a boy rushing in put a post on his lap and a wild boyish gasp of my gosh mayor gadsby look and gadsby saw a word about a foot high it was war lady gadsby saw it also slowly sinking into a chair at that instant both nancy and kathlyn burst frantically in nancy lugging baby lillian now almost two and a big load for so small a woman 
nancy gasping out daddy must bill and julius and frank and john gadsby put down his post and pulling nancy down on to his lap said nancy darling bill and julius and frank and john must old glory is calling baby and no branton hills boy will balk at that call it's awful but it's a fact now lady gadsby said nothing but nancy and kathlyn saw an ashy pallor on that matronly brow and gadsby going out without waiting for his customary kiss for what you might call an instant branton hills in blank black gloom stood stock still but not for long days got to flashing past with that awful sight of girls out to lunch saying four from our shop and that big cotton mill has forty-six who will go with virginia saying about all that our boys talk about is uniforms pay transportation army corps divisions naval squadrons and so on an occasional branton hills politician thought that it might blow out in a month or two but your historian knows that it didn't all of that blowing consisting of blasts from that military clarion calling for mobilization days 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 finally on may fourth that day of tiny nancy's big church ritual you know that day upon which any woman would look back with romantic joy nancy with kathlyn lady gadsby in his honor stood at branton hill's big railway station at which our municipal band was drawn up in back of which stood in solid ranks this city's grand young manhood bill julius frank john paul and norman standing just as straight and rigid as any as that long long troop train got its signal to start but you know all about such sights going on daily from our pacific coast to atlantic docks as it shot around a turn and gadsby was walking sadly toward city hall a grammar school boy hurrying up to him said wow i wish i could go to war hi said gadsby if it isn't kid banks ah cut that kid stuff i'm alan banks son of councilman banks oh pardon but you don't want to go to war boy ah uh, i do too but young boys can't go to war i know that and i wish this will last until i grow so i can go it's just grand a big cannon says boom boom and sit down on this wall boy i want to talk to you all right shoot now look alan if this war should last until you grow up just think of how many thousands of troops it would kill how many grand good lads it would put right out of this world gosh that's so ain't it i didn't think of guys dyin but a man has to think of that alan and you will as you grow up my two big sons just put off on that big troop train i don't know how long bill and julius will stay away your big cannon might go boom and hit bill or julius do you know frank morgan paul johnson and john smith all right that big cannon might hit that trio too nobody can say who a cannon will hit alan now you go right on through grammar school and grow up into a big strong man and don't think about war and gadsby standing and gazing far off to branton hills charming hill district thought i think that will bust up a wild young ambition but that kid turning back sang out say if this scrap stops and a big war starts aha boy you just watch alan banks son of councilman banks and a small fist was pounding viciously on an also small bosom by golly said gadsby walking away that's to-morrow talking so now this history will drift along along through days and months days and months of that awful gnawing doubt actually a paradox for it was a conscious coma mornings on which branton hills icy blood shrank from looking at our city's post for its casualty list was rapidly too rapidly growing days and days of our girlhood and womanhood rolling thousands of long narrow cotton strips packing loving gifts from many a pantry nancy and kathlyn thinking constantly of frank and john lucy almost down and out from worrying about paul 
kathlyn knowing just how julius is missing his hall of natural history and how its staff is praying for him nancy's radio shut down tight for so much as a thought of station k b h was as a thrust of a sword days 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 of shouting orators blaring bands troops from far away pausing at our big railway station as girls going through long trains of cars took doughnuts and hot drinks in gatsby's parlor window hung that famous world war flag of nothing but stars nobody knowing at what instant a gold star would show upon it a star for bill a star for julius ah bill branton hills fop bill gatsby now in an ill-fitting and unstylish khaki uniform gatsby's mansion had no brilliant night lights now just his parlor lamp and a small light or two in hallways or on stairways only our mare and his lady now worrying 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 but both of good staunch old colonial stock and carrying on with good old plymouth rock stability and nancy's baby lillian too young to ask why grandma wasn't hungry now and didn't laugh so much kathlyn got into our big hospital this studious young lady's famous biological and microscopic ability holding out an opportunity for most practical work for branton hills shot torn boys would soon start drifting in and thus it was with lucy sarah and virginia inspiring branton hills womanhood to knit 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 you saw knitting on many a porch knitting in railway trains knitting during band music in city park knitting in shady arbors out at our big zoo at many a woman's club and actually knitting in church finally a big factory down by a railway station put out a call for anybody man or woman who wants to work on munitions and many a dainty branton hills girl sat at big unfamiliar stamping punching grinding or polishing outfits tiring frail young backs and straining soft young hands knowing that this factory's output might and probably would rob a woman across that big atlantic of a husband or son but still it is war gatsby smoking on his ivy-clad porch as his lady was industriously knitting said in a sort of soliloquy war that awful condition which a famous military man in command of a division long ago said was synonymous with satan and all his cohorts war that awful condition of human minds coming down from way way back of all history that vast void during which sympathy was not known during which animals fought with tooth claw or horn that vast void during which wounds had no soothing balm until thirst agony or a final swoon laid low a gigantic mammoth or a tiny grasping fawn but now again in this grand day of man's magically growing brain this day of kindly crooning to infants in cribs kindly talks to boys and girls in school and blood-tingling orations from thousands of pulpits upon that holy command thou shalt not kill now again man is out to kill his own kind and lady gatsby could only sigh end of section twenty five section twenty six of gatsby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen gatsby by ernest vincent wright chapter twenty six as this story has shown youth if adults will only admit that it has any brains at all will stand out to-day in a most promising light philosophically youth is wisdom in formation and with many thoughts startling to adult minds and industrially this vast world's coming stability is now to-day in its hands growing slowly as a blossom grows from its bud if you will furnish him with a thorough schooling you can plank down your dollar that youth starting out from this miraculous day 
will not lag nor shirk on that coming day in which old joints rusty and crackling must slow down and calling for an oil can you will find that youth only is that lubrication which can run to-morrow's world but youth must not go thinking that all its plans will turn out all right and young marion hopkins found this out marion you know took part in our airport initiation but marion only a kid at that day has grown up or halfway up anyway and just graduating from grammar school upon which big day a child knows as much as any famous savant of antiquity but as this story runs in skips and jumps strict chronological continuity is not a possibility so marion is now half grown up now that big airport as you also know was just back of marion's backyard and as that yard was much too big for anything that marion's dad could do with it it was put up for disposal but nobody would go look at it to say nothing of buying it but old bill simpkins past antagonist of gadsby's organization of youth did go out to look at it but said with his customary growl too many aircraft always roaring and zooming too far out of town and you ask too much for it anyway but marion thought that branton hills as a municipality should own it figuring that that airport would grow and that yard was practically a part of it anyway so marion going to his honor as about anybody in town did without an instant's dallying told him what his council should do but said gadsby what a city council should do and what it will do don't always match up can't i go and talk to it what to our council no that is not as a body but if you can run across a councilman out of city hall you can say what you wish a councilman is just an ordinary man you know but a councilman out of city hall was a hard man to find and a child couldn't go to a man's mansion to talk him around but by grand luck in a month or so marion did find and win all but simpkins on council night simpkins took up a good or i should say bad half hour against branton hills buying any old dump or scrap land that is put up what was the city coming to and so on and so on and marion's backyard wasn't bought now youth is all right if you rub its fur in a way which suits it but man hold on to your hat if you don't and marion's fur was all lumpy boy was that kid mad now just by luck march thirty first coming along as days do you know found marion in front of a toy shop window in which way down front was a box of cigars with a card saying this brand will start his blood tingling and marion as boys say was on in an instant and bought a cigar not a box not a bunch but just a cigar coming out marion saw his honor and simpkins passing simpkins saying all right i'll drop around to-night and was marion happy wait a bit that night as gadsby and simpkins sat talking in his honor's parlor who would just by luck walk in but marion saying oh so shyly just thought i'd drop in to chat with nancy and on passing a couch slyly laid that cigar on it now simpkins in addition to his famous grouch was a parsimonious old crab who though drawing good pay as councilman couldn't pass up anything that cost nothing and in gazing around saw that cigar and with a big apologizing yawn and slinking on to that couch as a cat slinks up on a bird and oh so nonchalantly lighting a match was soon puffing away and raving about branton hills politics out in a back parlor sat marion and nancy on a big divan hugging tightly up arm in arm and almost suffocating from holding back youthful anticipations as simpkins said and that hopkins backyard stunt ridiculous why his kid was out trying to find all of our counsel to talk it into buying bah and did i block it i'll say i did you don't find kids today laughing at councilman simpkins an actual spasm of giggling in that back parlor had gadsby looking around inquiringly no sir simpkins said 
no kid can fool count bang gadsby jumping up saw only a frasly cigar stump in old bill's mouth as that palpitating individual was vigorously brushing off falling sparks as his honor's rugs got a rain of tobacco scraps gadsby was on in an instant noticing mary and nancy rolling and tumbling around on that big divan and doubling up in a giggling fit way out of control finally simpkins angrily got up viciously jamming on his tall silk hat and marion fighting that giggling fit just had to call out april fool councilman simpkins and mayor gadsby on a following council night got marion's land bill through many a councilman holding his hand in front of his grinning mouth in voting for bright vitalic youth end of section twenty six section twenty seven of gadsby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org gadsby by ernest vincent wright chapter twenty seven widow adams was sitting up again for it was way past midnight and virginia was out many months ago virginia was also out and was brought back unconscious so now nina was again sitting up for virginia was not a night owl sort of a girl finally around two o'clock nina couldn't stand it and had to call in a passing patrolman now this patrolman was an original organization of youth boy and had always known nina and virginia and said oh now i wouldn't worry so possibly a bus had a blowout or but virginia said nothing about going on a bus oh how could that child vanish so naturally all that the patrolman could do was to call his station and nina almost all in lay down until just about dawn a jangling ringing brought this half-wild woman to a front hall shouting this is nina adams talking who what virginia is that you what's wrong what you and harold thompson our aviator you did what took his aircraft to what city why that's so far you can't but virginia had hung up so nina also hung up and sat down with a big long sigh my virginia not running away but flying away to marry oh this youth of today around six o'clock that night virginia and harold stood arm in arm in nina's parlor as a big bus was groaning noisily away but mamma said virginia sobbing pitifully i didn't think you would that's just it virginia you didn't think but you should how could i know what was going on that's just you young folks of today you think of nothing but your own silly foolish doings and you allow us old good-for-nothings to go crazy with worry and nina sank in a gasping swoon on to a sofa but old doc wilkins arriving at virginia's frantic call knowing nina's iron constitution from childhood soon had that limp form back to normal and with a dark disapproving scowl at virginia said bring in a good batch of hot food and your ma will turn out all right and going out with a snort of disgust and banging viciously that big front door end of section twenty seven Section 28 of Gatsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Gatsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 28. Awful tidings in our Branton Hills Post has so wrought up our ordinarily happy laughing sarah who with paul abroad was back living again with old tom young that sarah sitting on a low stool by old tom's rocking chair was so still that tom put down his post saying gift of gab all round out kid but sarah had an odd thoughtful look 
Sarah's bosom was rising and falling abnormally, but finally, looking quickly up at old Tom, Sarah said, Daddy, I want to go to war. Do what? If Sarah had said anything about jumping out of a balloon or of buying a gorilla to play with, Tom Young wouldn't know any such astounding doubt as brought his rocking chair to a quick standstill. War? What kind of talk is this? A girl going to war? What for? How? Say, who put this crazy stunt into your brain anyway? As you know, Sarah was not only charming in ways, but also in build, and with that glorious crown of brownish gold hair, that always smiling mouth, and that soft, plump, girlishly girlish form, no man, Tom Young, nor anybody, could think of Sarah and war in a solitary thought. So Sarah said softly, Last night, our night school trio thought that our boys so far away must miss us and branton hills sights and doris said branton hills sounds and so why couldn't our trio join the big group of musicians which is sailing soon and daddy you know paul is in that army i don't know that i could find him but 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 i want to try and kathleen is talking of going as biologist with a big hospital unit so possibly i could stay with it tom young was dumb his post actually had told of such a musical outfit about to sail but it was a man's organization so now it has got around to this our girls our dainty loving girls brimful of both sympathy and patriotism wanting to go into that tough laborious work of singing in army camps in huts in hospitals singing from trucks rolling along country roads along which sat platoons and battalions of troops waiting for word which might bring to this or that boy his last long gun-toting tramp singing in ah darlin your trio was foolin wasn't it now girls don't daddy girls do so if our folks don't put up much of a aha now you said a mouthful if your folks don't darling i'll say just two words as my part in this crazy stunt nothing doing kathleen's work is mighty important singing isn't sarah had not grown up from infancy in kindly tom's cabin without knowing that his no was a no and not a flimsy hollow word which a whining or a sniffling or a bawling child could switch around into oh all right if you want to so sarah sat still on that low stool or to turn it around almost backwards sarah sat on that stool still so still that tom's old tin clock on its wall hooks was soon dominating that small room with its rhythmic ticking as a conductor's baton controls a brass band's pianissimos finally sarah said softly slowly sadly and with a big big sigh i did so want to go and that small clock was ticking 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 for a full hour sarah and old tom sat talking and rocking until sarah phoning to doris said my dad says no and doris phoning back to sarah said so did my dad and as virginia adams was that trio's third part and as sarah and doris had always known nina adams strong will and as oh hum it was a happy fascination until adult minds got hold of it end of section 28 recording by john brandon section 29 of gatsby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by john brandon gatsby by ernest vincent wright chapter twenty nine gatsby was walking back from a visit down in blanton hills manufacturing district on a saturday night a busy day's traffic had had its noisy run and with not many folks in sight his honor got along without having to stop to grasp a hand or talk for a mayor out of city hall is a shining mark for any politician and so coming to broadway a booming bass drum and sounds of singing told of a small salvation army unit carrying on amidst broadway's night shopping crowds gatsby walking toward that group saw a young girl back towards him just finishing a long soulful oration saying and i can say this to you for i know what i'm talking about for i was brought up in a pool of liquor as that army group was starting to march on with this girl turning toward gatsby his honor had to gasp astonishingly why mary anter oh if it isn't mayor gatsby i don't run across you much nowadays how is lady gatsby holding up during this awful war all such family gossip passing quickly gatsby said but this salvation army work mary how long mary and his honor had to walk along as that big drum was now pounding a block away during that walk gatsby found out all about the vast void in mary's bungalow following that fatal auto crash and all about two old maid aunts as mary said who had all the pantry's liquor thrown down a drain and got out also a day or two following all about living now at old lady flanagan's for i just couldn't stay in that bungalow with nobody around you know and all about loving companionship in that grand old lady's arms and of mary's finding that flanagan who got such a wallop from anter's killing wasn't drinking so much now which put it into mary's mind that many a man would with kindly coaching turn from it and i think that my nightly talks against liquor hit and hit hard too for almost nightly a poor down and out will follow along with our band promising to cut it out and go straight oh why didn't i try to stop norman's drinking probably said gatsby you did in your girlish way but you know boys don't think that small girls know anything i'd put up any amount that norman in that far away camp is thinking of you constantly oh if i could only know that and a look of almost sanctity and a big long-drawn sigh told what a turmoil was going on in this girl's mind but i'm going on and on with this night talking until norman is back again possibly a plan will turn up toward both of us living down our past and our sorrow and gatsby slowly plodding along towards his dimly lit mansion thought of a slight transposition of that scriptural quotation and your sins you adults shall fall upon your offspring until your third and fourth oh if a man could only think of his offspring having to carry on long past his last day and of how hard it is for a boy or girl to stand up and proudly claim that so-and-so was my dad if all branton hills knows of that dad's inglorious past poor kids for you know that gatsby said in his story start that a man should so carry on his daily affairs as to bring no word of admonition from anybody for a man's doings should put a strain upon no soul but his own but aha uh -huh. as his honor got to his parlor his sad mind found a happy smiling lady awaiting him 
crying joyously look look john word from william from bill in paris bill's first communication said darling folks julius and i just got into this town from a month of hard marching ditch digging and fighting i am all right and so is julius ran across frank who is on duty at our commissary lucky guy lots of food always around hall is growing fat looks mighty good oh how all of us do miss you and good old branton hills i can't find a solitary suit in this town that i would put on to go to a dogfight such fashion and so on just a natural outpouring from a boy away on his first trip from his dad's kindly roof ha <laughs> ha said gadsby laughing jovially that's our bill all right always thinking of dolling up and lady gadsby rising quickly said oh i must call up nancy kathleen and sarah and in a trio of small bungalows joy wild joy found its way into girlish minds as gadsby sat going through this word again and again a mirthful chuckling had lady gadsby asking what's so funny about it nothing only if i didn't know that frank is such a grand good lad i think bill was hiding a bit from us for that on duty at commissary might amount only to potato paring end of section twenty nine recording by john brandon Section 30 of Gatsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Gatsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 30. Priscilla Standish was waiting at our big railroad station on a warm spring day for a train to pull out so that cross-track traffic could start again it was just an ordinary train such as stop hourly at branton hills but priscilla saw that a group was hurrying toward a combination car way up forward now priscilla was not a girl who found morbid curiosity in any such a public spot but still an odd uncanny sort of thrill almost a chill in fact was urging urging a slow walk toward that car just why priscilla didn't know but such things do occur in a human mind so priscilla soon was standing on a trunk truck gazing down into that group which now was slowly moving back forming room for taking out a young man in khaki uniform on a hospital cot with a gasp of horror priscilla was instantly down from that truck pushing through that group and crying out wildly arthur arthur rankin oh oh what is it darling and looking up at a hospital assistant is it bad don't know right now lady said that snowy-clad official unconscious but our big hospital will do all it can for him arthur rankin arthur with whom priscilla had had many a childhood spat arthur who had shown that puppy stuff for priscilla that his old aunt was always so disapprovingly sniffing at and now unconscious on a with a murmuring of sympathy from that sorrowing public now dissolving as all crowds do priscilla had a quick comforting thought kathlyn is working at that hospital kathlyn had known arthur as long as priscilla had and kathlyn's famous ability would so our panting and worrying girl was hurrying along through broadway's turning and inquiring crowds to that big hospital which our organization of youth had had built and now arthur was going for not long possibly but still possibly for it was midnight in that big still building 
old dr wilkins stood by arthur's cot priscilla sobbing pitifully was waiting in a corridor with lady standish giving what comfort a woman could lady standish who took in dogs cats rabbits or any living thing that was hurt sick or lost lady standish donor of four thousand dollars for our big zoo lady standish kindly saviour of clancy's and dowd's big four now waiting without ability to aid a human animal finally dr wilkins coming out said kathlyn says no sign of blood contamination but vitality low badly low sinking i think railroad trip almost too much for him looks bad but at this instant an assistant calling wilkins said arthur was coming out of his coma and was murmuring about a woman known as priscilla do you know anybody by with a racking sob priscilla shot through the door lady standish quickly following arthur picking up a bit from priscilla's soft oh oh so soft and loving crooning and patting took that fond hand and sank back dr wilkins looking knowingly at priscilla said if it is as i think you too had had thoughts of a vigorous nod from priscilla and an approving look from lady standish and dr wilkins said hmm it should occur right now or as quick as a flash that snowy clad assistant was phoning and astonishingly soon our good pastor brown stood by that cot and with arthur in a most surprising pickup holding priscilla's hot shaking hand through that still hospital room was wafting priscilla's soft low words you for my lawful husband until dr wilkins going out with priscilla now trying oh so hard for control with grand charming loving kathlyn arm in arm said that joy will pull him through boys at war so far away will naturally droop both in body and mind for lack of a particular girl snuggling and cuddling so just wait until kathlyn finds out all about his condition and good food with this happy culmination of a childhood infatuation will put him in first-class condition if no complications show up ah oh, what an important part of a city's institutions a hospital is what a comfort to all to know that should injury or any ailing condition of man woman or child occur without warning anybody can simply through phoning find quick transportation at his door and with angrily clanging gongs or high-pitched whistlings obtaining a right of way through all traffic that institution's doors will swing apart assistance will quickly surround that cot and an ability for doing anything that man can do is at hand you know almost daily of capitalists of philanthropic mold donating vast sums to a town or an association but in your historian's mind no donation can do so much good as that which builds or maintains hospitalization for all a library a school a boys or girls club a vacation facility a chair of this or that in an institution of instruction all do much to build up a community both doctoring as a study for a young man and nursing for a girl for most important parts of mankind's activity and so just four months from that awful but also happy day arthur rankin sat in a hammock with priscilla on lady standish's porch with four small rankins playing around or was walking around that back yard full of cats dogs rabbits and so on with no thought of soapbox orations in his mind end of section thirty recording by john brandon Section 31 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 31 On a grand autumn morning, Branton Hills postboys ran shouting down Broadway, showing in half foot wording. Fighting stops. History's most disastrous war is history now. And again Branton Hills stood stock still, but only for an instant, for soon it was in all minds. Thank God, oh, ring your loud church clarions, blow your factory blasts, shout, cry, sing, play your bands, burst your drums, crack your cymbals. Ah, what a sight on Broadway, shop girls pouring out, Shop janitors boarding up big glass windows against a surging mob, and, shh, many a church having in its still sanctity a woman or girl at its altar rail. Months, 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 Branton Hills was again at its big railroad station, its municipal band playing our grand national air as a long troop train, a solid mass of bunting was snorting noisily in and amidst that outpouring flood of Branton Hills boys, Lady Gadsby, Nancy, Kathleen, and his honor found Bill, Julius, Frank, and John. Sarah was just going all apart in Paul's arms, with Virginia swooning in Harold's. On old Lady Flanagan's porch sat Mary Antor, for having no word from Norman for months, this grand young Salvation Army lass, was in sad, sad doubt. But soon, as that shouting mob was drifting away, in happy family groups, walking citywards, a khaki-clad lad, hurrying to old Lady Flanagan's cabin, and jumping that low, ivy-clad wall, had Mary sobbing and laughing in his arms. No, it wasn't Norman. End of section 31section 32 of gadsby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by logan lorenz gadsby by ernest vincent wright chapter 32 a crowd was standing around in city park for a baby was missing patrol cars roaring around breton hills many a woman hunting around through sympathy kidnapping rumors flying around his honor was out of town, but on landing at a railroad station and finding patrol cars drawn up at City Park, saw in that crowd's mist a tiny girl of about six, with a bunch of big shouting patrol officers asking, Who took that baby? Did you do it? Which way did it go? How long ago did you miss it? Say, kiddo, why don't you talk? An adult brain can stand a lot of such shouting, but a baby's is not in that class. So, totally dumb and shaking with fright, this tot stood, thumb in mouth, and two big brown baby orbs just starting to grow moist, as his honor, pushing in, said, Wait a bit. And that bunch in uniform, knowing him, got up and Gatsby sat down on a rock, saying, You can't find out a thing from a young child by such hard, gruff ways. This tiny lady is almost in a slump. Now just start this crowd moving. I know a bit about youth. That's right, said a big husky patrolman. If anybody living knows kids, it's you, sir. So, as things got around to normal, his honor, now sitting flat on City Park's smooth lawn, said jovially, Hello, -a. a big gulping sob in a tiny bosom. Didn't gulp. And a grin ran around a small mouth, as our young lady said, So many big cops. Oh, I got afraid. I know, darling, but no big cops will shout at you now. I don't shout at tiny girls, do I? No, sir. But if folks do shout, I go all woozy. Woozy? Woozy? Ha <laughs> ha. I'll look that up in a big book. But what's all this fuss about? Is it about a baby? A vigorous nodding of a bunch of brown curls. What? Fussing about a baby? A baby is too small to fuss about. Oh, it isn't. No? No, sir. I fuss about my dolly. And it's not half so big as a baby. That's so. Girls do fuss about dolls. My girls did. How many dolls has your girls got? 
Ha ha, not any now. My girls all got grown up and big. During this calm, happy talk, a patrolman coming up said, Shall I stick around, Your Honor? Any kidnapping facts? I don't know just now. Wait around about an hour and drop in again. So his honor, mayor of Branton Hills, and childhood sat on that grassy lawn, a tiny tot making daisy chains, grass rings, and thrilling at Gatsby's story of how a boy known as Jack had to climb a big, big, tall stalk to kill an awfully ugly giant. Finally, Gatsby said, I thought you had a baby playing with you. I did. Huh, it isn't playing now. Did it fly away? Oh, no. A baby can't fly. No, that's right. But how could a baby go away from you without your knowing it? It didn't. I did know it. Now, many may think that his honor would thrill at this information, but Gatsby didn't. So, playing around for a bit, his honor finally said, I wish I had a baby to play with right now. You can. Can I? How? With a tiny hand on baby lips, our small lady said, Go look in that lilac arbor, but go soft. I think it's snoozing. And Gatsby, going to that arbor, got a frightful shock, for it was Lillian, Nancy's baby. Not having known of this kidnapping, as his family couldn't find him by phoning, it was a shock, for his honor was thinking of that young woman collapsing. So, upon that patrolman coming back, as told, Gatsby said, Go and call up your station, quickly. Say that I want your captain to notify my folks that Lillian is all right. Good gosh, your honor, is this tot your grandchild? Grandchild or no grandchild, you dash to that box. And so again, John Gatsby, champion of youth, had shown officialdom that a child's brain and that of an adult vary as do a gigantic oak and its tiny acorn. End of section 32Section 33 of Gatsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Logan Lorenz. Gatsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 33. Most of Gatsby's old organization of youth was still in town, though, as you know, grown up. So, on a spring day, all of its forty boys and as many girls got most mystifying cards saying, Kindly go to Lilac Hill on May 6th at four o'clock. Important, important, important. That was all. Not a word to show its origin. No handwriting. Just a small plain card and ordinary printing. Not only that old organization, but his honor, Lady Gatsby, Old Tom Young, Tom Donaldson, Nina Adams, Lady Standish, and old Lady Flanagan got that odd card. Ah, what's this, anyway? Sing out that good old lady. Is it court summons? A picnic? Or a land auction? By gory, it looks phony. Old Tom Young, in his rocking chair, said, A card to go to Lilac Hill. It says, important. Ah, this youth of today. I'll put up a dollar that I can sniff a rat in this. But my girl is all right. So I'll go. And so it was, all around town. Nobody could fathom it. Lilac Hill was as charming a spot as any that our big city park could boast. Though known as a hill, it was but a slight knoll with surroundings of lilac shrubs, which, in May, would always show a riot of bloom, this knoll sloping down to a pond with islands, boats, and aquatic plants. Lilac Hill had known many a picnic and similar outings, for Bratton Hills folks, living for six days amidst bricks and asphalt, just had to go out on Sundays to this dainty knoll, living for an hour or so amongst its birds, blossoms, and calm surroundings. City traffic was far away, only a faint rumbling coming to this natural sanctuary, and many a mind and many a worn body had found a balm in its charms. But that mystifying card, from whom was it? What was it? Why was it? Oh, hum! Why rack brains by digging into it, was Branton Hill's popular thought. But go and find out. That also was our organization's thought as May 6th was approaching. My gracious, said Nancy, it sounds actually spooky. But calm, practical Catherine said, 
Spooks don't hop around in daylight. May 6th had just that warm and balmy air that allows girls to put on flimsy, dainty things and youths to don sports outfits. And his honor, as that mystifying day was not far off, said, This, I think, is a trick by a kid or two to show us old ducks that an incog can hold out right up to its actual consummation. I don't know a thing about what's going on, but by golly, I'll show up, and if any fun is afloat, I'll join in full blast. But, as our organization, boys and girls, and Brenton Hill's folks got to Lilac Hill, not a thing was found giving any indication that anything out of ordinary was to occur. Just that calm, charming knoll with its lilacs, oaks, and happy vista out across Bretton Hills Hill Districts. What is this, anyway? A hoax? But all sat down, talking in a big group, until, at just four o'clock, look, a stir out back of that island boat landing. What? On that pond? This card said Lilac Hill. But I said that a stir was occurring in back of that boat landing, with its small shack for storing oars and such. If our big crowd was laughing and talking up to now, it quit. And quit mighty quickly, too. If you want to hold a crowd, just mystify it. Old Lady Flanagan was starting to shout about this phony stuff, but Old Man Flanagan said, Shut up. You ain't part of this show. Nancy was actually hopping up and down, but Catherine stood calmly watching. For this studious girl, way up in an ology or two, knows that, by slow, thoughtful watching, you can gain much as against working up a wild, panicky condition. Lady Gatsby said again and again, What is going on? But Nina Adams said, You ought to know that today anything can... But look again. From in back of that boat landing, a big ferry float is coming. Slowly, 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 a cabin amidships, just dripping with lilacs, as still and noncommittal as old Gibraltar. Slowly, on and on it is coming, finally stopping right at that spot upon which our group is standing. Forty boys, forty girls, and a big mob, all as still as a church. What is it, anyway? Is anybody in it? Not a sign of it. But wait, aha, it has an occupant, for coming out of that lilac glory is Parson Brown. Parson Brown? What was Parson Brown in that cabin for? Aha, a lilac spray is moving. And, as our groups stand stock still, look, Lucy Donaldson is coming out. Oh, what a vision of girlish joy and glory. And, and, and ah, that lilac spray is moving again. Hello, ah, uh, Bill Gatsby is coming out. A spring sun was slowly approaching its horizonward droop shooting rays of gold down onto our gasping crowd. As Parson Brown said, William Gatsby, do you... William, but shortly back from abroad, you know, standing with grand military rigidity, said, I do. And Lucy Donaldson, do you... It didn't last long, just a word or two. A burst of music of a famous march by John Smith, Bretton Hills organist, in that cabin with a small piano. Just a, but that crowd couldn't wait for that. With a whoop, his honor sprang into that pond, waiting swiftly to board that fairy craft, and in an instant Nancy was following him, splashing frantically along, and scrambling aboard to almost floor Bill with a gigantic hug as his honor shook Bill's hand with a loving arm about Lucy. Old Lady Flanagan was shouting wildly, Whoops! Whoops! By Gora! This young gang of today is a smart boonch! And his honor said, Ha ha, I didn't know a thing about this. Bill's a smart chap. And old Tom Donaldson, grabbing happy, laughing, blushing, palpitating Lucy, as soon as that young lady was on dry land, said, Say, you sly young chick, why didn't you notify your old dad? Why, daddy, that would spoil all my fun. End of section 33
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright Section 34 Gadsby, Clancy and Dowd just had to, according to unanimous opinion, go out to Lady Standish's suburban plot of ground to visit Big Four. Gadsby, owing to an inborn liking for all animals, Clancy and Dowd from fond association with this particular group. It was a glorious spot, high rolling land with a patch of cool shady woods and a grand vista across hill and plain with shining ponds and rich farmlands. And did Big Four know Clancy and Dowd? I'll say so. And soon, with much happy whinnying and acting up, with two big rounds poking inquiring snouts in Clancy's hands and two big blacks snuggling Gadsby and Dowd, as happy a group of man and animals as you could wish for, was soon accompanying Lady Standish around that vast patch. Anything that such animals could want was at hand. A bright, sparkling brook was gabbling and gurgling through a stony gully or dropping with many brilliant rainbows down a tiny fall. Sally, said Gadsby, you do a grand work in maintaining this spot. If mankind as a body would only think as you do that an animal has a brain and knows good living conditions, you wouldn't find so many poor, scraggly, old dobbins plodding around our towns, dragging a cart far too big and with a man totally without sympathy on it. And Lady Standish said, I just can't think of anybody abusing an animal, nor of allowing it to stay around, sick, hurt, or hungry. I think that an animal is but a point short of human, and having a skin varying, but slightly from our own, will know as much pain from a whipping as would a human child. A blow upon any animal, if I am within sight, is almost as a blow upon my own body. You would think that, with that vast gap which mankind is continually placing back of him, in his onward march in improving this big world, man would think a bit of his pals of hoof, horn and claw. But I am glad to say that, in this country, laws in many a community admit that an animal has rights. Oh, how an animal that is hurt looks up at you, John. An animal's actions can inform you if it is in pain. It don't hop and jump around as usual. No, you find a sad, crouching, cringing, small bunch of fur or hair, whining and plainly asking you to aid it. It isn't hard to find out what is wrong, John. Any man or woman who would pass by such a sight, just isn't worth knowing. I just can't withstand it. Why, I think that not only animals, but plants can know pain. I carry a drink to many a poor, thirsty, growing thing, or if it is torn up, I put it kindly back and fix its soil up as comfortably as I can. Anything that is living, John, is worthy of man's aid. End of section 34section 35 of Gatsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Gatsby by Ernest Vincent Wright, Chapter 35. Poor old Bill Simpkins. Nothing in this world was worth anything. Nobody was right. All wrong. All wrong. Simpkins had no kin, and, not marrying, was just plodding along, living in a small room, with no fun, 
no constant company, no social goal to which to look forward, and had thus grown into what boys call a big old grouch. But it wasn't all Simpkins' fault. The human mind was built for contact with similar minds. It should, in fact, it must think about what is going on around it. For if it is shut up in a thick, dark, bony box of a skull, it will always stay in that condition known as status quo, and grow up antagonistic to all surroundings. But Simpkins didn't want to growl and grunt. It was practically as annoying to him as to folks around him. But as soon as that shut-up, solitary mind found anybody wanting it to do anything in confirmation of public opinion, no, that mind would contract as a snail in its spiral armor and balk. Lady Gatsby and his honor, in talking about this, had thought of improving such a condition, but Simpkins was not a man to whom you could broach such a thought. It would only bring forth an outburst of sarcasm about trying it out in your own brain first. So Branton Hills' counsel always had so toward emotion as to, in a way, blind Simpkins as to its import. Many such emotion had a hard fight showing him its valuation as a municipal law, such as our big hall of natural history, our zoo, and so on. Now nothing can so light up such a mind as a good laugh. Start a man laughing, good, long, and loud, and his mind's grimy windows will slowly inch upward. Snappy, invigorating air will rush in, and, lo, that old snarling, ugly grouch will vanish as hoarfrost in a warm spring thaw. And so it got around, on a bright spring day, to old Bill sitting on Gatsby's front porch. Outwardly calm, and smoking a good cigar, which did not blow up, but inwardly just full of snarls and growls about Branton Hills' youth. Silly half-grown young animals, found out that two plus two is four, and thinking that all things will fit just that way. Now that small girl, of about six, who had had Nancy's baby out in City Park, was passing Gatsby's mansion and saw old Bill. A kid of six has, as you probably know, no formally laid out plan for its daily activity. Anything bobbing up will attract. So with this childish instability of thought, this tiny miss ran up onto Gatsby's porch and stood in front of old Bill, looking up at him, but saying not a word. Huh. Bill just had to snort. Looking at anything? No, sir. What? Oh, that is, you think not much, probably. What do you want, anyway? I want to play. All right. Run along and play. No, I want to play with you. Pooh! That's silly. I'm an old man. An old man can't play. Can too. My grandpa can. But I'm not your grandpa, thank my lucky stars. Run along now, I'm thinking. So am I. You? Huh. A kid can't think. Oh, I can. About what? About playing with you. Now Simpkins saw that this was a condition which wouldn't pass with scowling or growling, but didn't know what to do about it. Play with a kid? What? Councilman Simpkins, pfft. but in that shut-up mind, through a partially, only partially, rising window, was wafting a back thought of May Day in City Park, and that happy, singing, marching ring of tots around that ribbon-wound mast. Councilman Simpkins was in that ring. So this thought got to tramping around and round many a musty corridor in his mind, throwing up a window, busting in a door, and shoving a lot of dust and rubbish down a back stairway. Round and round it ran until old Bill, slowly and surprisingly, softly said, What do you want to play? Oh, oh, what a victory for that talk. What a victory for youth. And what a fall for grouchy, snarling maturity. I think that Simpkins, right at that instant, saw that bright sunlight coming in through that rising window, rising by baby hands and from that bust-in door. I think that old Bill cast off in that instant that hard, gloomy coat of dissatisfaction which was gripping his shut-up mind. And I think, in fact I know, that old Bill Simpkins was now, that is, was, 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 oh, just plain happy. What do you want to play? This is a lady a going to town. Play what? 
My, don't you know how to play that? All right, I'll show you. Now just stick out your foot. That's it. Now I'll sit on it, so. Now you bump it up and down. Ha ha, ho ho, that's it. This is a lady a-going to town, a-going to town, a-going to town. And as that tiny lady sang that baby song gaily and happily, old Bill was actually laughing, and laughing uproariously too. As this sight was occurring, his honored lady Gatsby, looking out from a parlor window, Gatsby said happily, A lady physician is working on old Bill, causing Lady Gatsby to add, And a mighty good doctor, too. End of section 35. Section 36 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 36. It was night again. That small Salvation Army group was parading and singing. A young girl would soon start a long oration against drink. Now boys, gawking as boys always do, saw a shadowy form of a man slinking along from doorway to doorway, plainly watching this marching group, but also plainly trying to stay out of sight. A halt, a song or two, and Mary Antor was soon walking towards old Lady Flanagan's cabin. But... In passing big dark city park, a man, rushing wildly up, wrapping that frail form in a cast iron grip, planting kiss upon kiss upon Mary's lips, finally unwound that grip and stood stiffly in military saluting position. Mary, naturally in a bad fright, took a short, anxious, inquiring look, and instantly all that part of City Park actually rang with a wild, girlish cry. Norman! Hello, kiddo. Just got in half an hour ago on a small troop train, and by luck saw you marching in that group. Wow! But you do look grand. And you look grand, too, Norman, but, but, but not drunk? No sis not for many a day now saw too much of it in camp big grand corking good chaps down and out from it days and days in jail military jail you know and finally finding a bad conduct stamp on company books no sir i'm off it for good on old lady flanagan's porch mary sat way past midnight with no not with norman only but with two khaki-clad boys and it was miraculous that that small loving childish bosom could hold so much joy old lady flanagan in nightgown and cap looking down a front stairway and old man flanagan also in nightgown and cap and also looking down said oh go on upstairs you snoopin varmint who's a snoopin varmint not you of go on up i say by golly that darling girl has found a mountain of gold with norman and who's that with norman that guy's around nights now as say you do you go up or do i swat you end of chapter thirty six Section 37 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 37. Bill Gadsby, going abroad, naturally wasn't on that ballot for Councilman Anders chair. But this history shows that that mouthy antagonist, who had had so much to say about pink satin ribbons and vanilla sprays, didn't win. No, a first-class man got that position, old Tom Young, Sarah's dad, as good an old soul as any in all Brandon Hills. 
and was sarah happy oh my and was sarah proud two oh mys tiny nancy loyal as always to bill said bill was as good as in for nobody knowing my bill would ballot against him and bill would hold that honor now but for old glory's calling that's right nancy darling you stick up for bill for though bill didn't know it until many months a citation for outstanding and valorous conduct in action was soon to go through our national printing plant for a city fop or an outdoor part of a tailor shop is not always a boob you know gadsby's mansion was again brightly aglow that night that world war flag not hanging in his window now and so on labor day night lady gadsby and his honor sitting in his parlor thought that a light footfall was sounding out on his porch as gadsby got up to find out about it julius coming in with a young girl stood looking grinningly at lady gadsby who jumping up said happily why mary anter no ma said julius this is not mary anter not mary anter why julius i think i know ma not mary anter ma but mary gadsby oh oh my darling girl and half crying and half laughing mary was snuggling in lady gadsby's arms and his honor coming in saying by golly that young cuss cupid is mighty busy around this town why i can hardly walk two blocks along broadway without a young girl who has grown up in a night stopping and saying mayor gadsby this is my husband but i'll say that cupid's marksmanship has always brought about happy matings and mary you darling kid your sad dark shadows will gradually pass and lady gadsby and i will try to bring you loads and loads of comfort but say you julius i didn't know that you and mary ho 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 said mary laughing didn't you know that julius and norman and i sat out nights on old lady flanagan's porch why no how should i i don't go snooping around anybody's porch ha ha dad said julius no snooping would find that out mary and i had had this plan so long ago that i didn't know a world war was coming end of section thirty seven Section 38 of Gadsby. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Florence Short. Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright. Chapter 38. As a small boy, your historian was told that a king was in his counting-house accounting out his cash or similar words which told practically of his taking account of stock so also gadsby was on his thinking porch a thinking of his past a mighty good thing to do too if anybody should ask you if said his honor you can't find any fun during childhood you naturally won't look for it as you grow up to maturity you will grow hard and look upon fun as foolish also if you don't furnish fun for a child don't look for it to grow up bright happy and loving so always put in a child's path an opportunity to watch talk about and know as many good things as you can lady gadsby from a parlor window said practicing for a stumping tour or a political powwow ha ha no just thinking out loud so as thinking cannot hurt anybody his honor was soon going on affairs which look small or absurd to a full-grown man may loom up as big as a mountain to a child and you shouldn't allow a fact that you saw a thing so much that i am sick of it to turn you away from an inquiring child you wasn't sick of it on that far past day on which you first saw it 
I always look back happily and proudly to taking a small girl to our city for a big glass building, to a group at our night court, a group finding out about dispatching our mail, and our circus. Boy, that was fun. Our awarding diplomas at City Hall, tiny Marion at our airport's inauguration, our manual training school graduation, all that did a big lot toward showing youth that this big world is not half bad if adults will but watch aid and coach and i will not stand anybody snapping at a child particularly a tiny tot if you think that you must snap snap at a child so big as to snap back i don't sanction talking back to adults but ha <laughs> ha i did find a grand big wallop in marion's april fool cigar whoo did old bill jump but that did no harm and a sad young mind found a way to match things up with an antagonist now just stand a child up against your body how tall is it possibly only up to your hip still a man or an animal thinking that it is a man will slap whip or viciously yank an arm of so frail so soft a tiny body that is what i call a coward by golly almost a criminal if a tot is what you call naughty and no child voluntarily is why not lift that young body up onto your lap and talk don't shout about what it just did shouting gains nothing with a tot man can shout at man at dogs and at farm animals but a man who shouts at a child is at that instant sinking in his own muck of bullyism and bullyism is a sin if anything in this world is ah youth you glorious dawn of mankind you bright happy glowing morning sun not at full brilliancy of noon i know but unavoidably on your way youth how i do thrill at taking your warm soft hand walking with you talking with you but most important of all laughing with you that is man's pathway to glory a man who drops blossoms in passing will carry joy to folks along the way a man who drops crumbs will also do a kindly act but a man who drops kind words to a sobbing child will find his joy continuing for many a day for blossoms will dry up crumbs may blow away but a kind word to a child may start a blossom growing in that young mind which will so far surpass what an unkindly man might drop as an orchid will surpass a wisp of grass just stop a bit and look back at your footprints along your past pathway did you put many humps in that soil which a small child might trip on did you angrily slam a door which might so jolt a high-strung tot as to bring on nights and nights of insomnia did you so constantly snarl at it that it don't want you around in fact did you put anything in that back path of yours which could bring sorrow to a child or start its distrust of you as its rightful guardian if so go back right now man and fix up such spots by kindly acts from now on or jump into a pond and don't crawl out again for nobody wants you around lady gadsby as this oration was wafting off amongst lilac shrubs and across soft warm lawns had sat also thinking finally coming out on to that ivy-bound porch and sitting down by his honour saying that was just grand john but i was thinking along a path varying a bit from that you know that man's brain is actually all of him all parts of his body as you follow down from his brain act simply as aids to it his nostrils bring him air his mouth is for masticating his food 
his hands and limbs furnish ability for manipulation and locomotion and his lungs stomach and all inward organs function only for that brain if you look at a crowd you say that you saw lots of folks but if you look at a man bathing in a pond and if that man sank until only that part from his brow upward was in sight you might say that you saw nobody only a man's scalp but you actually saw a man for a man is only as big as that part still in sight now a child's skull naturally is not so big as a man's so its brain has no room for all that vast mass of thoughts which adult brains contain it is so to say in a small room but as days and months go by that room will push its walls outward and that young brain gradually fill up all that additional room so looking for calm cool thinking in a child is as silly as looking for big juicy plums amongst frail spring blossoms why oh why don't folks think of that you know what foolish sounding things julius was always asking as a child how can just rubbing a match light it why is it dark at night why can't a baby talk but you and i john didn't laugh at him no not for an instant and now look at our julius and our catherine both famous just through all that asking and our aid john god could put man into this world full grown but god don't do so for god knows that without a tiny hand to hold a tiny foot to pat tiny lips to kiss and a tiny warm wriggling body to hug man would know nothing but work gadsby sat smoking for a bit finally saying darling that pair of robins up in that big oak with four young and you and i in this big building also with four know all about what you just said and and hmm, it's almost midnight and his honor's mansion was soon dark bathing in soft moonlight end of chapter thirty eight section thirty nine of gadsby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by florence short gadsby by ernest vincent wright chapter thirty nine practically all brandon hills was talking about councilman simpkins for councilman simpkins just didn't look natural and councilman simpkins didn't act natural in fact councilman simpkins was crawling out of his old cocoon and though an ugly snarling dowdy worm had lain for so long shut up in that tight mass of wrappings around his brain now a gay smiling moth was coming out for councilman simpkins was dolling up if bill gadsby was known as a tailor shop's outdoor part old bill was not a part no old bill was that tailor shop outdoor indoor or without a door in fact councilman simpkins now had it such as our films talk about so much today but simpkins outfit was not flashy or loud suits of good cloth hats of stylish form always a bright carnation just south of his chin boots always glossy and a smart springy walk had all broadway gasping as this apollo vision swung jauntily along nancy happy giggling nancy was all of a grin about this magic transformation and with that old inborn instinct of womanhood told lucy you just watch and mark my word a woman is in this pudding old bill just couldn't boom out in such a way without having a goal in sight and i'll put up a dollar on it and lucy also a woman said smilingly 
and i'll put up a dollar and a half but his honour and lady gadsby at such talk would look skyward cough and say possibly a woman and a mighty young woman at that now if anything will warm up a public it is gossip particularly if it is about mystifying actions of a public man and this had soon grown to a point at which a particularly curious man or woman thought of going to old bill and boldly asking who is it but as i said what councilman simpkins would say to such butting in was known to all brandon hills no councilman simpkins could doll up and trot around all that that portly solon might wish but so to say a sign was always hanging from his coat front saying hands off nina adams and virginia sat on gadsby's porch with nancy and kathleen and old bill was up as a topic virginia constantly smiling and inwardly chuckling hadn't much to say about our frisky councilman and nancy and kathleen couldn't fathom why but nina not so backward said Poofed. if a man wants to throw old clothing away and buy stylish outfits what affair is it but his own it isn't right so to pick out a man and turn him into a laughingstock of a city old bill isn't a bad sort possibly born grouchy but if a grouchy man or woman and i know a bunch of that class in this town can pull out of it and laugh and find a bit of joy in living i think it is an occasion for congratulations not booing oh said kathleen i don't think anybody is booing councilman simpkins but you know that any showing of such an innovation is apt to start gossip just why i don't know it though is a trait of mankind only animals don't bloom out so abruptly you can hunt through biology zoology or any similar study and find but slow awfully slow adaptations toward any form of variation hurrying was not known until man got around my said nancy gasping and not giggling now i wish that i could know all that you know kathy as our slang puts it i don't know nothing but you could said kathleen if you would only study all through our young days you know with you and bill out at a card or dancing party you in flimsy frills and bill swishing around in sartorial glory i was upstairs studying and so was julius that's right said nina i wish virginia would study oh i am said virginia all aglow you studying what aviation harold is going to show now virginia harold is not and nina adams's foot was down it's not so bad for a man to fly but a girl but mamma lots of girls fly nowadays i know that and i also know a girl who won't and just as lucy has always known that old tom young's no was a no just so had nina adams brought up virginia but said kathleen this guy shooting talk isn't finding out anything about councilman simpkins and virginia said possibly old bill wants to fly high i think i'll ask harold about taking him up for a jaunt this bringing a happy laugh all around nina said now don't jolly poor bill too much i don't know what or who got him to going social and nancy giggling said i put up a dollar with lucy's dollar fifty that it's a woman oh i don't know now said nina a man isn't always trotting around on a woman's apron strings and as it was growing dark nina and virginia got up to go passing down gadsby's front walk a soft night wind brought back that porch now virginia quit this 
you will stay on solid ground ah oh, ma harold says but a big bus roaring by cut it short just a month from this his honour sitting on his porch with his morning post ran across a short bit just two rows of print which had him calling hi which lady gadsby took as a signal for a quick trip to that porch all right your honour on duty what's up gadsby folding his post into a narrow column and handing it to that waiting lady said nothing as that good woman saw that paragraph gadsby saw first a gasp following that a grin and finally why of all things so that's nina that row of print said simply by pastor brown on saturday night in pastor's study nina adams and councilman simpkins why said lady gadsby laughing nina sat on this porch only last month talking about old bill but saying nothing about this i'm going right around to hug that darling woman for that is what i call tact so as nina and our lady sat talking nina said you know that bill and i growing up from kids in school always got along grandly no childhood spats but still it was no crush such as youth falls into as bill got out of high school i still had two rooms to go through you also know that i wasn't a miss for long from graduation day but irving adams was lost in that awful titanic calamity and i brought up my baby in my widowhood bill was always sympathizing and patronizing though all brandon hills thought him a cast-iron crouch but a public man is not always stiff and hard in his off hours and bill and i slowly but gradually finding many a happy hour could all right you grand luscious thing and lady gadsby and nina sat laughing on a couch as in old old school days and said nina happily poor bill's upstairs now putting his things around to suit him living for so long in a small lodging all his things stayed in a trunk a lodging room always has various folks around you know and a man don't lay his things out as in his own room so nina said lady gadsby do you know what brought him out of his old shut-in way of looking at things from just a word or two bill drops occasionally i think that a child is and lady gadsby said you know our good books saying about and a tiny child shall End of section 39。section 40 of Gadsby。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer。please visit LibriVox.org。Gadsby by Ernest Vincent Wright。chapter 40 。Six months from that day upon which old Mars, god of war, had angrily thrown down his cannons, tanks, gas bombs, and so on, fuming at man's inability to stand up to it, Gadsby's mansion was dark again. Not totally dark, just his parlor lamp and a light or two in halls and on stairways. And so this history found Nancy and Kathleen out on that moonlit porch nancy sobbing fighting it off and sobbing again tall studious loving kathleen sitting fondly by nancy's tiny form said now sis i wouldn't cry so much for i don't think that conditions just now call for it b -b -b but i'd stop if i could wouldn't i and poor nancy was sobbing again now wait and Kathleen, uncommonly cross, vigorously shook Nancy's arm. You can't gain a thing this way. Mama is probably all right. Oh, is that you, Daddy? His honor sat down by his two girls. Gadsby was not looking good. Black rings around his always laughing orbs, a hard cast to that jovial mouth, a gray hair or two, 
cropping up amongst his wavy brown. But Gadsby was not old. Oh, no, far from it. Still, that stoop in walking, that odd, limp slump in sitting, that toning down and joviality, had for six months past had all Branton Hills sympathizing with its popular mare. Days, 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 and oh, that tough part, nights, 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 nights of two young chaps in full clothing, only just napping on a parlor couch, nights of two girls nodding in chairs in a dimly, oh so dimly, a lit room. It got around almost to Christmas, only a fortnight to that happy day, but happy in Gadsby's mansion? Finally, Frank took a hand. Now, kid, do try to stop this crying. You know I'm not scalding you, darling, but you just can't go on this way. And that's that. I'm trying so hard, hubby. Now Nancy was of that good sturdy old colonial stock of his honor and Lady Gadsby. And so, as Christmas was approaching, and many a bunch of holly hung in Broadway's big windows, and as many a Salvation Army Santa Claus stood at its curbs, Nancy's constitution won out. But a badly worn young lady was in and out of Gadsby's mansion daily, bringing baby Lillian to kiss Grandma, and riding back with Frank at about six o'clock. Old Dr. Wilkins, coming in on a cool, sharp night, found his honor, Nancy, Kathleen, Bill, Julius, Lucy, Mary, Frank, and John, all in that big parlor. Now, you bunch, it's up to you. Lady Gadsby will pull through all right. Nancy rushing wildly to kiss him. It hangs now upon good nursing, and I know you will furnish that, and I will say without a wisp of a doubt that a calm, happy room, not too many around, and, 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 Julius, can't you hunt around in our woods that you and Kathleen know so thoroughly, and find a tall, straight young fir, cut it down, rig it up with lights, and a lot of shiny stuff, stand it up in your ma's room, and, tis a night, almost Christmas, and all through that room a warm joy is stirring, no sign of a gloom, and ma, sitting up, in a gay gown and cap, no, no, will not start on a long wintry nap, for, out on that lawn, a group of girls stand, a group singing carols with part of our band, and that moon in full vigor was lustrous and low. Our lady is singing. Aha, now I know that Nancy and Kathleen and Julius and Bill and also his honor, will sing with a will, and old Dr. Wilkins, amidst it all stands, smiling and nodding, and rubbing his hands, and sliding out slyly, calls back at that sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. Along about midnight, a happy group sat around Gadsby's parlor lamp, as Dr. Wilkins was saying, Stopping a war, that is, stopping actual military combat is not stopping a war in all its factors. During continuous hard strain, a human mind can hold up, and it is truly amazing how much it can stand, day by day, with that war strain of worry pulling it down, it staunchly holds aloof as a mighty oak in facing a storm. But it has a limit. With too much and too long strain, it will snap just as that mighty oak will fall in a long fight. Lady Gadsby will avoid such a snap, though it is by a narrow margin. As this group sat in that holly-hung parlor with that big cloth sign in big gold capitals, Happy Christmas across its back wall, with horns tooting outdoors, with many a window around town aglow with tiny dancing tallow dip lights, with baby Lillian all snuggling so warm in a cot as vision of sugar plums. And why shouldn't a baby think of sugar plums on that night, almost Christmas? As I say, this happy group sat around Gadsby's lamp 
Mars, that grim old war tyrant, was far, far away. Upstairs, calmly snoozing on a big downy pillow, Lady Gadsby was now rapidly coming back again to that buxom, happy-go-lucky first lady of Branton Hills. End of section 40